Help Jews in Poverty at HelpJewsNow.org. Your $25 gift today will help provide a life-saving food box to Jews in need. Be a blessing right now. Visit HelpJewsNow.org. That's HelpJewsNow.org. Welcome to the Viking Age Podcast, part of the Fan Sided Podcast Network. Now, please welcome your host, Adam Patrick. All right. Welcome to the Viking Age Podcast, the official podcast for thevikingage.com. I'm your host, Adam Patrick. I'm the editor and lead writer for the Viking Age. Before we get started today, make sure to follow the Viking Age on Twitter and Facebook. The site's username on Twitter is at the Viking Age, and you can follow the site's Facebook page by heading to facebook.com slash the Viking Age. All right, on today's show, we've got Bo Brack. He's the co-host of the Locked On Cardinals podcast, since the Cardinals and Vikings are facing off in the Patrick Peterson Bowl this <laughs> Sunday in Arizona. Welcome to the show, Bo. Hey, man, I'm glad to uh, join you and, and talk about the uh, the return of P3, which we're calling him on the podcast these I days. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're adding a little petty, an extra, yeah. you know, keep it going. Right. Um, right. Petty Patrick Peterson returns to the desert where he was, he's going to be enshrined in the Ring of Honor. <laughs> it, yeah. It's not a question if, it's when. Uh, yeah. But right now, things a little, uh, a little dramatic with uh, Patrick Peterson and his former team, but definitely start here for since 2011. One of the best draft picks in the franchise's history, definitely since they came to the desert and it's going to be, it's fun. I mean, it's, it just gives more storylines to oh, yeah. an exciting open to the season for the Arizona Cardinals. For sure. It's a late game. So there's going to be a lot of eyes on it. Yeah. Um, for sure. So a lot of, a lot of, but a lot of Cardinals fans have been, been talking trash about Patrick Peterson this week and, and yeah. in past weeks, rightfully so, you know, he kind of burned some bridges on his way out of there and maybe even while he was there. Um, but is there any part of you that is maybe worried about him bringing out his best to the table this weekend, especially since he, he will be facing his old team? The thing about Patrick Peterson, though, is it, it, even at his best, it, it tends to be teams shying away from him. Yeah. Like as far as his impact on the actual game and in passing attacks, I mean, sure, he can force some incompletions and stuff, but he's never been kind of like a, a ball, ball hawk. He hasn't been a big ball hawk for a long time. Uh, you know, three interceptions, a couple seasons here and there. But uh, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not like expecting a big play from Patrick Peterson. That ha- hasn't kind of been his forte lately, uh, but I, he can certainly shut guys down. I mean, that's what the main fear is. It, can he can he keep some of the wide receivers quiet? But the, the Arizona Cardinals showed at least in week one. And, you know, take that as a, a small sample size. But that I think that they do have in place now some playmakers opposite Patrick Peterson, where a guy like Bashad Breland is going to have a tough time in back to back weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's just keeping it to to P three. It's you know I, I think his big game <laughs> if Love he secures a pick, <laughs> if he secures a pick, you know that's a big W for him, mm-hmm. and and it kind of uh, you know. I, does it vilify him a little bit? Does it? Does it? Uh, or I'm sorry, vindicate him a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but. You know, him going and getting $10 million from the Minnesota Vikings and then saying what he said, mm-hmm. you know, it's going to be a very hostile atmosphere, I think, for for Peterson as he go, comes back to the desert. But I, he, he's I'm not I'm not one of the big guys that thinks Patrick Peterson's production fell off a cliff. Yeah. I think that he's a starting caliber cornerback. I don't think he's like locked down like he once was it's right. not it's no longer like uh patrick peterson island anymore like Revis island but yeah. it's he's he's still a, a good player he played well in his debut for the vikings mm-hmm. i don't expect him to like struggle mightily against the cardinals even though he's going up against a pretty stout receiving core now yeah i think from what you just said a good game for him would probably be just to like shut down De- deandre hopkins just keep him that's quiet. a good game for anybody. If anybody yeah, keeps, yeah. if yeah. anybody keeps, Luke, you know, quiet, you know, if they keep them, you know, out of the end zone, two, two touchdowns last week. And, uh, you know, if they, if they keep him, you know, he's going to see a ton of targets. If they yeah. keep his targets and, and the, um, the amount that Kyler Murray is going to complete to him, you know, around 50, 60%, it's probably a good game. Yeah. Um, but looking back, Peterson, I think some, some things started with him in Arizona around what, like 2018 when he asked for, yeah. A trade, but yeah, 
Can you blame Peterson for wanting to be traded in 2018 when the Cardinals, I think they were one and six at that point, and it, he was he's getting older, and maybe he wanted to go somewhere where he could end his career with a you know win a championship. 2018 was one of those seasons for the, especially for the Arizona Cardinals that they. I, I don't even know if they'll even acknowledge it. If you were to go to their yeah, facility in yeah. Tempe, Arizona, and you were to talk to anybody in that building, they'd be like, yeah, you know, it was great. You know, 2017 it was the end of the Bruce Aarons era and then the beginning of the Kyler Murray era. They, they would just skip over 2018. Like, they don't want to acknowledge it. Steve Wilkes, the silly, like, uh, team building things. They actually had, like, you have uh, Sam Bradford that year? They had, oh, <laughs> you really have to bring that up. Yeah, they had Sam Bradford that they paid handsomely to play three games. They had Josh Rosen that they traded up to take 10th overall. Oh, yep. And they uh, they they were just turning the page on one of the more successful t- uh, tenures uh, from a head coach ever in the history of the, of the team. Um, and the, it was one of the most poorly constructed rosters you'd ever seen. So, yeah, I, I do get the frustration, but, you know, he's being paid handsomely. He was still, yep. you know, within the top. I want to say top seven paid corners in the league, and he's supposed to be one of these leaders in this organization. Like you mm-hmm. don't hear. That he, his locker was across from Larry Fitzgerald. You didn't hear that from number 11. Right. Larry Fitzgerald was never going through his agents and saying, hey, get me out of the desert because this is just a brutal start because he would never do that. And like we always viewed Patrick Peterson as the su- potential successor of Larry Fitzgerald. And that was just kind of that ended it. That's it. It's, it wasn't going to happen. So uh, I think after that, and there was no going back, even if he, he apologized later at the uh, right. big golf tournament, the Waste Management Phoenix Open, there's a big hole, it's the 16th hole, yep. and it's raucous. It's, it's just filled with people in the stands, and they're rowdy. And Peterson gets everybody fired up by saying, hey, I'm here to stay, and then gets popped for PEDs <laughs> a couple months later. And it's just like he just couldn't get out of his own way. Mm-hmm. So it was... It was an it was it was an ugly divorce, but it was a, it, the honeymoon phase did last for a long time. It did. I mean, crap. Like 2011 to 2017, that's a good run. Eight mm-hmm. Pro Bowls. That's mm-hmm. that's nothing. Like I said, Ring of Honor. It's gonna happen. It's not if. It's when. Yeah, we could we could talk about Peterson, the Cardinals all day, but lastly, on him, just um, just a one year deal for Peterson with the Vikings. Um, yeah. If he performs well this season, do you think maybe there's a there's a good chance that he ends up staying in Minnesota or do you think he tries to capitalize on the salary cap increasing next year? Because yeah. that was my home. That's been my whole impression that he's coming to Minnesota. He sees Mike Zimmer. He's the one who <laughs> actually like, sought out the Vikings to come and cause he knows Mike Zimmer is good with older defensive backs, or whatever to get his maybe career back on track and get that final big payday next year. What do you think? Yeah, I think he's going to chase the paycheck <laughs> and, and I, I don't, and I'm not going to fault the guy. I mean, he's, he's no, no, over, he's 31, right? He's 31 years old. And if somebody, if some team, as you said, yeah, I mean, the salary cap's going to, was going to get up to close to 220. It's going to go up by 20 or 30 million. Next year. Yeah. It's going to be crazy. And there's going to, it's going to be an op, you know, the opposite of what it was this past off season. And right. he got 10 million in a rough off season, 8 million, I know. And then 2 million incentives. If he, uh, yeah, if he, if he plays well, which he's capable of doing, he could parlay it into a two, three year contract where he's going to see a lot of guaranteed dollars and it's going to be his last big payday in the NFL. I, and I wouldn't, I don't think anybody should fault him for that. Uh, you know, does he, does he give the Vikings a one year hometown discount for kind of keeping him, you know, as one of the more relevant cornerbacks? Maybe a slight, <laughs> you know, chunk of change goes away, but not, I wouldn't expect if, if the money, I mean, if the money's even sure, but if it's not, you know, he, he I, I wouldn't even be surprised he went down to like a team like Jacksonville if they paid the most. He's from Florida. Uh, right. it, it all or even like the Dolphins or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm, that would be unfair. I mean, P3 yes, <laughs> with Xavier and Howard and, and Byron Jones and mm-hmm. yet yeah, that front seven, that'd be that would be kind of a good fit for him. Or even the Bucks, I guess, because. Yeah, Tom Brady will probably be there for another five years. And, and a coaching staff that he's familiar with. Oh, uh, yes. I That's good. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, all right, before we get to some some current Cardinals and Vikings, one last thing. You spend the first hour of your vacation at the luggage carousel thinking there's nowhere to go but up. But there is a place to go but up. Because when you open your suitcase, you find it filled with dolls. Dolls like the ones in that movie that scared you so much you wet your girlfriend's bed. Ah, Marissa, the one that got away. You return the bag to the airport with relief. It lasts until you get back to your room, where a fallen doll waits to greet you. Don't let a suitcase full of dolls ruin your vacation. Go on a real vacation. Go RVing. Larry Fitzgerald. Is he done? Yeah. I think so. 
I think this is like a hokey love song, you know, like if you love something, set it free. And he just set the Arizona Cardinals free. You know, it was the, the money wasn't the money wasn't right. And we all know. And that's not like an indictment on Larry Fitzgerald saying that he's, uh, you know, he's greedy or he's looking for it's he's only going to play for a big payday. But he's a he's a smart business savvy guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was he was getting paid way over his market value for, you know, at least one, maybe two seasons. And that uh, that was no longer an option. The Arizona Cardinals were a bad franchise during those times, and they needed this this you know face of the franchise to stay in the fold to kind of keep the fan base happy. Well, they turned the page and they rebuilt everything. And uh, you know, I just it, he no longer had that kind of crutch, I guess, I don't, for lack of a better uh, word. Um, I just think that he said a couple years ago, he's like, look, there's not going to be any podium when I retire. There's not going to be any tears. Uh, he's just going to quietly, you know, just walk away. And that's kind of what's going on right now. I mean, yeah. you don't hear from the guy for the longest time. And it used to be kind of like Brett Favre where every off season was, is Larry Fitzgerald going to hang it up or is he going to come back? And usually he'd, he'd say pretty quickly, you'd be right around, you know, February, March, Fitz is coming back and it just never happened. And I think that, uh, once that happened, there was no going back. It would it would take a very unique scenario, or maybe like a guy like AJ Green, who they just signed this offseason, gets hurt, and the team's in contention, right. and they do have eleven million dollars surplus in cap space to where they could pay him. So it would take you know the stars aligning, but I think for the most part, the odds are that he's going to stay retired, and we watched him play an incredible career where he ended up second in most major receiving stats behind Wayne Jerry Rice, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if he comes back, he's not going anywhere but Arizona, right? I, yeah, I wouldn't think so. I mean, if it would, it would take probably the same scenario for Minnesota, right? I mean, that if you just want to follow right. the tea leaves, if you want to connect right. the easy dots. Yeah. I think there's, there's three teams that he could potentially play for Cardinals, Vikings obviously grew up ball boy, yep. all that. You know, if if they if they are able to, you know, get off of this bad week one performance and turn things around, uh, I mean, their number three receiver, they're, they're, they feel like they figured that situation out. Osborne, yeah. yeah, you know, Osborne, he, he flashed in preseason and mm-hmm. they like him, but you know, Fitz would work it pretty well and he could yep. play a little slot. Uh, and then Tampa. I think Tampa also could be an option if 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 they had an injury and they needed somebody to come down there and play the and just Arians. be a possession guy. Yeah. And reconnect with Bruce Arians. Those are your options. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think he's done. Um but all right. So moving on to the current Cardinals. Last week the Cardinals scored thirty eight points in week one against the Titans. Blew them out. Uh those thirty eight points are actually tied for the most in a game they've had since Cliff Cliff. Kingsbury became their head coach in 2019. Um, so do you expect 30 plus points to be the norm for the Cardinals <laughs> offense this season? Or are you taking maybe more of a wait and see approach since the Titans yeah. defense isn't exactly to, expected to be that good this season? What what was Tennessee doing this offseason as far as the, <laughs> it, building and, and improving that defense that was it was it was bad last year, and it, mm-hmm. it was it was a big leap. And Vrabel's of faith. a defensive guy, right? Yeah, Vrabel's a defensive guy, but then he's empowering his defensive coordinator, who didn't have a good debut for them mm-hmm. in Week One. Uh, and, and like they bring in Caleb Farley, who had the medical issue pre-draft, but yeah. obviously he's a, he's a very impressive prospect from Virginia Tech in the first round. And then Elijah Molden was a good you know prospect out of Washington. He had some good preseason games, and you know Bud Dupree comes over. The injury with the $80 million contract, the pass rush position in Autry in the middle, it, it wasn't a lot that they did. More more talent kind of walked out the door in Nashville than than, than came in. Um, the Arizona Cardinals, I, I think it was kind of, it was under the radar because of the Julio Jones signing, how they neglected some big pieces in, in Arthur Smith leaving their offensive yeah. coordinator. The Arizona Cardinals caught kind of a perfect storm. So, when you ask, was it maybe a fluky start for the Arizona Cardinals? I think, I think it can be somewhere in be- in between, and th- that might be too political for your listeners. From me, like, <laughs> I I just don't know because they finished so you know horribly at the end of last season. The Arizona Cardinals offense that they scored under twenty points between the last two games. Sure, they went up against the top defense in the Rams, 
with barely Kyler Murray in the lineup. Right. They had Chris Trevor, who's a CFL guy in there for the most game of the game. But, you know, it was such a Jekyll and Hyde offensive performance in 2020 for the Cardinals that I think you would be naive not to say, hey, let's pump the brakes on the week one performance. But you can also say at the same token, I'm very encouraged by this. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that Cliff Kingsbury actually has the personnel that would fit his offense. You talk about Larry Fitzgerald. And there was a guy I'll give credit to Kyle Odegaard who covered this team for the web, yeah. their team website for a long time. A uh, very respected uh, writer and reporter. And he's now right for somebody else. And he kind of said, Hey, uh, this might be blasphemous a little bit, but Larry Fitzgerald leaving gave the Arizona Cardinals an opportunity to deploy guys like Christian Kirk mm-hmm. playing in the slot and guys like Rondell Moore, mm-hmm. uh, who was a second round pick out of Purdue to kind of just be problems against opposing defenses because they have too much speed. You know, it's just like, and that works with Cliff Kingsbury's offense, a lot of underneath stuff. It's not like Larry Fitzgerald, who's going to, you know, I'm going to be a little, little, uh, it's just, he had like a 0.5 yak. I mean, it was just like brutal. It was like, he'd catch the ball and then he was down immediately where he was, uh, where he caught the ball. So those guys, Rondell Moore, I mean, he had, I'm I'm scared of him. I know. I'm I'm, I'm worried. He had like 63 yards receiving, and I think 50 of it was all after the catch. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, he was, just, yeah, he's just a, he's just a bad dude. I, I just, I think that it fits pretty well with what Cliff Kingsbury wants to do. Big question is like, w- when you see consistent offenses, and you know, maybe I think the Buffalo Bills could be like the anomaly in this. Is like you need that run pass balance. Mm-hmm. Josh Allen brought that a little bit, but they didn't have that last year. But right. they were successful. The Arizona Cardinals, where's that balance going to be? Can they rely on Chase Edmonds as an RB1 and, and James Conner, who has been a guy who hasn't been exactly reliable to stay in the lineup, you know, avoid injuries? That's their running back stable. So can they can they keep those guys out there consistently enough to, to keep that balance and get that consistency? That's going to be a big question, too. And it's a murderous row in the division, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they all go. They, they all won. Right, they all won. Yeah, yeah. Not like the NFC the, North, where everyone lost. They're the anti NFC North. Yeah, like they're in first place uh, with a zero <laughs> and one record. Right. Uh, but we talked about Kyler Murray a little bit. So he had a great game, week one, five total touchdowns. Uh, he got snubbed for the uh, NFC Offensive Player of the Week <laughs> award for some reason. Um, yeah. And many are, but many are expecting him to take a big step in his career this year. Um, but what concerns you the most yeah. about Murray this season? You you're always concerned about his staying healthy. Is yeah. that is it is it fair to say that because he played every game in Oklahoma, played every game last season, he played every game in his rookie season, he hasn't missed a game. He was really banged since. up last year though. He was absolutely, and he wasn't the same quarterback. And you know that's to say that he was in the lineup and that he was the same guy is you're you're lying. So yeah. you know health is a concern. So when we talk about the health of Kyler Murray, it's not necessarily missing games. So that's a concern because of his unique size, right? Yeah. Uh, and that you're only going to hear that from Cardinals host Coleman, like unique, he's small, right? <laughs> he's small, <laughs> but, uh, he's, he's pretty good at avoiding, you know, taking hits. You very, you like, I don't know if I've ever seen him get squared up. So there's that. And then everybody was talking about the intermediate passing. Uh, you know, he, he get, he's, he's very talented throwing the deep ball. Mm-hmm. He's good. you know, getting the ball to playmakers underneath, uh, but intermediate, like, you know, those 10 to 20 yard passes, he struggled a little bit. You know, he improved, but he struggled still and people didn't see enough to give him, you know, I, I think PFF had him as like their 17th ranked quarterback and their main knock was his ability to hit in the intermediate game. And he was six for 12, I think last week with two touchdowns, intermediate passing. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that's going to be a problem. I think he's a talented thrower. Yeah. So we'll see how he does with that. Uh, so very few things. I mean, if 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 you're taking if you're if you're concerned about Kyler Murray, you know you you've got like you you've, you're kind of micro you're 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 nitpicking a little bit, but yeah, he 37 total touchdowns last year, five to start this season as you mentioned. He had the one turnover. Turnovers has never been something that bugged him or or really crushed the Cardinals. He lost one game where he threw three picks against Detroit. That's like one out of 32 career games that he's he had where he turned the ball over way too often. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I already mentioned Rondell Moore. I'm scared of him. I'm not really excited <laughs> about Kyler Murray either because the Vikings, not even this team, but historically the Vikings going against mobile quarterbacks, not been good. I'm sure you've seen the 
constantly played highlight of Michael Vick uh, scrambling in the two Vikings hitting each other as he, he runs by yeah. them. Yeah, everyone's <laughs> seen that. I always love when it's his birthday and they sp- spread that around. It's great. Um, but, all right, on the defensive side of the ball, Cardinals secondary. They did great against mm-hmm. A.J. Brown, Julio Jones, week one. Um, but how confident are you that they can do something similar against Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen? Yeah, I'm, I mean, but, you know, the same question was being asked in week one going up against Julio Jones and, and A.J. Brown. Yep. Uh, but you know, the, the former, the, the Vikings, as you mentioned, they are, uh, they, they, they were solid in week one. I mean, yep. you saw Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen and healthy two touchdowns, right? Um, you know, I, I think, and I think Kirk is a lot better against pressure than, than Tannehill, you know, looking yep. at the numbers, Tannehill yep. and, and him both faced about eight or nine hits last week. Tannehill just happened to be sacked six times, uh, <laughs> where Kirk was sacked three times. But credit Cousins for getting ball out, you know, yeah. and I think uh, in his number is significantly better than Tannehill's were. Um, so I, I think I liked what I saw. It's just like the offense. I'm encouraged by the secondary. Byron Murphy, who is their CB one now, he's mm-hmm. it, it, Malcolm Butler was going to be in the in the mix for that, but he retired. He's on the reserve mm-hmm. retired list. And Byron Murphy, a third year guy to Washington, took a step in Week One. He did, and I think he he has potential to be a household name. At the cornerback position, you know, uh, he breaking up passes, he, he dropped the pick, you know, but still getting in the position to, to make that play. He just he really did ball out week one. I, I like what I saw from Byron Murphy. There was rumblings throughout the offseason that they were confident that he was going to take the step. And he showed at least in one game that that he had. I mean, he was a guy that they were going to primarily rely upon on the inside. And now he's an out. He's, he's your true CB one. And then. Getting outside of that is a guy that hasn't played for two years in Robert Alford, who played really well against Tennessee as well. Uh, he was the one that got his hands on the one pick that they had, deflected it, and then Isaiah Simmons was able to pull it down. And then Marco Wilson, who's a fourth round pick out of Florida, who I don't think uh, you know a lot of people know about, just because you need to get that deep into the draft. Unless you're drafting, you know, you know about Marco Wilson, but he's an absolute tool, tool shed. He is. I mean, sub four four forty. He's a guy that he, he leapt 43 and a half inches on his vertical, just an absolute beast. You know, he, he, if you're thinking about who is Marco Wilson, he's the guy that threw a shoe against LSU. He took an LSU player's oh. shoe and threw it, got penalized. <laughs> and it was a key moment in that game because it, it pretty much mm-hmm. sealed the deal for the Tigers. Marco Wilson, you know, what's between the years? And his brother was a second round kind of bust for Indy and Quincy Wilson. So there was a couple knocks against him, but he played really well in his first game as a fourth round pick. He played the most of any of the Arizona Cardinals rookies as far as snap count. He played 91% of the time. He was out there basically the whole time and uh, he held his own really well. So I'm pretty confident, but you know, it, it's a little bit easier. And we saw this with the Washington football team last year where you take like a pedestrian defensive secondary and your front seven can really make life easier on oh, them. Yeah. Because they're getting all that pressure. I mean, I think anybody, you and I could probably go back there and defend fairly well when you got Chandler <laughs> Jones just coming mm-hmm. off the edge like a, J. J. a freak. Yeah, J.J. Watt and uh, you know, Collins. Zavin, Isaiah Simmons. Yep. It's, a, it's yep. a long list. Marcus Golden. It's it, yep. They got a lot of guys. They got a great stable. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, I remember when Malcolm Butler announced his uh, or not, I don't even know if he announced it, it was just reported that he was going to be on yeah. the, on the retired list. Mm-hmm. And then all you heard, I think for the next couple of days after that, I was like, okay, who, who are the Cardinals going to sign? Like what, what veteran or who are they going to trade for? And they didn't, they didn't do any of that. I think they maybe brought in someone, you know, just for depth wise. Um, but they kind of kept the, the same guys that they had. And I th- think they kind of showed why last, yeah. last week that they're, they're confident in the guys that they have. So it's no. like when you when you see a, a, a the the pre draft process play out right yeah. and and you just play the easy connecting the dots you're like okay this team's need is a cornerback yeah. and this is what they need and then you they go a completely different direction and, and you realize that the Arizona Cardinals thought process on the cornerback room was completely different than the fan base right. like the fan base was like oh they they are this is you're gonna send this group out. Yep. That's what you're going to send against the future Hall of Famer and Julio Jones and one of the best young receivers in AJ Brown. And they, they proved to be right. Like not v- very often does that happen in Steve Kimes tenure, but his scouting, his coaches, it, everybody in that, in the Cardinals facility knew better than everybody else. And, uh, you know, 
chalk that up to them. Yeah, Vance Joseph, you know, he's a yes. no, known to be do very well with defensive back, so it's probably not as surprising knowing that he's yeah. back there. But speaking of coaches, Cliff Kingsbury, is he gone if the Cardinals don't make the playoffs this season? Uh, I guess it's um, it depends on how that looks, right? I mean, if they go, you know, with the seventh spot, We'll see what that uh, what what gets you there. Is it is it is it nine and eight? You sneak in. You have to oh, go so 10 you can and... see it happening if they if they make the playoffs. No, no, no. I'm saying if if they make the playoffs, he's fine. Okay. I, I'm saying he doesn't get fired even like even if they miss the postseason. What I'm saying is like, what's the magic number to get the playoffs? You know, oh. is the, is the last team in? Is it a nine and eight team? Is it, oh, okay, is it... okay. So if the Arizona Cardinals go nine and eight, right? Yeah, it's disappointing. But can you really fire somebody if you're the Arizona Cardinals? And you're looking at who's going to be available as potential coaching candidates. Yeah, you sense. fire a guy that goes, you know, improves every <laughs> single season, at least record wise, for this organization since getting there. It, like, mm-hmm. does that make sense? Do you go get Brian Dable? Do you go get, you know, it doesn't look like Eric Bieniemy is going to be an option potentially if he goes to USC. Right. You know, do you go and do you target these guy, all these these guys? You know, probably somebody from Bruce Arians' Tampa Bay staff is going to be uh, a trendy pick. Um, which I just don't think unless things re- unless the wheels really do fall off, man. I mean, like, I, I don't think that he's going to be sent back. I, I don't. And, and this team is pretty they they dig in quite a bit. Like Steve Kimes still the general manager. And we mentioned 2018. It was one of the worst like, like ESPN ranked them the worst team of the decade. And that was against <laughs> there was like a winless Browns team in there. Yeah. It was the, it, the Arizona <laughs> Cardinals were the worst because of how bad that roster was and how bad. It was constructed. So I, I don't think he's his seat is as hot. Like, you know, I were actually talking about the um about hot seats because Bet Online had released like their their mm-hmm. odds. And uh in King in Kingsbury's on there. Yeah. I mean, because people believe like, hey, this team needs to be go further than they did, even last year. But last year, if they made the playoffs, they would have been ahead of schedule, you know? So uh now they need to game. kind of keep it. It was a game. Yeah. All they need to do is win a game. Right? Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I, I, I understand the frustration of the fans, but at the same time, you also have to give a little credit. And it's if, if he if he is still on a head coach, you know, he, he's, his seat is going to be extremely hot going into the next season. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed, I think, with Kingsbury, the way that he just um, he's just solid. I feel like he the team, I don't think feel like there hasn't been a lot of problems in far as far as like the locker room goes and stuff uh, with the team. So I think just just even just doing that is impressive in the NFL these days because, you know, things can get out of hand rather quickly. You mentioned the Browns. You think of Freddie Kitchens and how that situation yeah. just just got worse and worse and worse. Um, all right. So last question. I'll get you out of here. Cool. How does your view about the Cardinals' chances this season change if they lose to the Vikings on Sunday? I think it, it it gets back to where we were last year as far as following this team. It, it gets back to here's a team that is not ready to compete. And it's not a team because the Vikings are a team that their last few wins have been against Detroit, Jacksonville, and uh, one other down team. It was Detroit, Jacksonville, Panthers. and Carolina. Yeah. And, uh, and they haven't beat any teams that have been good. And the Arizona Cardinals need to prove that they can beat teams like that because if they don't, then they're going to have to upset some teams that they're not expected to beat. And if you want to be a good team, you got to take care of business, especially in your home opener against a team like the Vikings that are going to be down. I mean, who knows what's going to happen with Eric Hendricks? Is he going to play? Mm, uh, you know, yeah, there, there's a I couple of guys. So. Barr's not going to play. <laughs> nope. They're going to be Griffin's ex- hurt too. Yeah, Griffin's hurt. Um, you know, I, as far as when you look at the defensive side of the ball, didn't, didn't, uh, Harrison Smith miss, miss, uh, no, practice as well. He's, he's good. good to go. Okay. Thank God. And then Michael Pierce is like the only guy that like invokes any kind of fear as far Daniel as Hunter. He, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if Daniel Hunter gets, it gets a couple sacks, you know, is, is that going to yeah. change the game right. for the no, Cardinal? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, but, uh, yeah, I just, it, it would, it would, it would be like, okay, here we go again. It's, it's like. Take one step forward and two steps back. And that's not like an indictment on the Viking. It's more like yeah. the Cardinals' expectations, where they are, they can be taken way down with with a loss in week two at home. Yeah, I don't even know. Do you, off the top of your head, do you know what the over-under is? Um, yeah, it's a 50, I think it was 51 and a half last yeah. time I checked. So that's that's probably got to be one of the highest 
Uh, yeah, and last week. week was yeah, last yeah. week was too for the Cardinals. Uh, it was just it, I think it it started at like fifty two and a half, and then it got to as high as fifty four, uh, which I sweated that, out. <laughs> the spread the spread did drop today though. Um, oh yeah, for the Cardinals, I think um, at least for for win bet it was four and a half points, and dropped to three and a half today. I think mostly because I saw like ninety six percent of the wagers are on the Cardinals, so the ninety six. Yeah, so the sports books are looking to make a little bit wow. of money. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Um, so yeah, I think that's why they did that. But that's all I got for you today, Bo. Where can people follow you on Twitter? Yeah, at b o b r a c k. Easiest way to find it, just put Bob Rack in there. You can find me, or just uh, at Locked On Easy Cards. You can find the show. We have a good time over there breaking down. Uh, each and every Cardinals performance and the, the latest breaking news with the team. Yeah, I've listened to multiple episodes. I think it's it's one of the best, I feel like, team-specific podcasts. Thanks, man. To, for sure. Appreciate I'm not it. even just saying that because you're a guest. It definitely, I feel like I come away from it knowing a lot more about the Cardinals uh, than I did before I started the episode. So, yeah, definitely go check that out. Subscribe to the podcast. You said you mentioned you do the, the NFL yeah. Sure. Yeah, locked on, locked on NFL. Uh, I'm the Monday host, so I'm recapping everything that happened the previous weekend on Sunday, and uh, just have some fun that way. So you can find us on YouTube or wherever you find podcasts. All right, let's go check that out on Apple Podcast app. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. But until next time, we will talk to you later. Help Jews in Poverty at HelpJewsNow.org. Your $25 gift today will help provide a life-saving food box to Jews in need. Be a blessing right now. Visit HelpJewsNow.org. That's HelpJewsNow.org.